like an Egyptian mummy. It's a grim and controversial murder case that simply refuses to die. This is one of those cases that will never end. There's always those cases. <laughs> But now, M. William Phelps, the investigative author of 35 real-life crime books, takes us inside the Tracy Fortson case. A woman who's either a heartless killer or a scapegoat in a sensational murder mystery. Not only did she say she was innocent, but that she seemed to be making a case for it, and other people seemed to be making a case for it. Suggesting Tracy may have had a target on her back the day she broke through. To become the first woman deputy in the history of the Oglethorpe County Sheriff's Office in Athens, Georgia. So here was a kind of a type A personality female in a man's world. Her mother, Sharon, was confident Tracy would succeed. Tracy was a strong person. She told me, you have to be strong and you have to separate yourself from some of this, the things that you see when you work in law enforcement. And Tracy, the 35-year-old single mother of a teenage daughter, relished the challenge. She loved what she was doing. I mean, she loved being a deputy, even though at times, I think, that environment was difficult for her to thrive in. It didn't become any easier when Tracy dared to make a stand for women's rights at the sheriff's office. She believed that she wasn't being paid what the men were being paid in her same position, and she thought that was unfair. Tracy didn't stop there. She also started to complain about some of the talk around the office, sexual talk and, and innuendo and that sort of thing. And in a phone interview with Crime Watch Daily, Tracy called out one male deputy in particular. Said something about me being a stripper before I ever came to work at the sheriff's department, which was not true. And he made comments that he had pictures of me with two men that he never produced. Tracy says she tried to brush off the harassment as just another one of the hazards of the job. I worked in a, in a man's world. I mean, I was the only female deputy that worked at the sheriff's department. And I grew up around guys, and I know how guys are. But she says her boyfriend, Doug Benton, a 38-year-old welder and bodybuilder, wasn't so forgiving. I should never have come home and said, hey, you know, this was said to me today, or, you know, this was done, or this was insinuated, or whatever. That was my biggest mistake. Tracy says an angry Doug persuaded her to wear a wire to sting the sheriff's office. We purchased a mini cassette recorder, and I recorded the sheriff making lewd comments and some of the other guys in the department. And with that recording in hand, Tracy says Doug convinced her to resign and file a sexual harassment lawsuit against the sheriff's office. Doug thought I was sitting on a gold mine. He thought there was a lot of money involved. He told me that there would settle out of court. Tracy says it was difficult to argue with him. He was right. I had a good case. But in hindsight, she thinks it may have been a little too good. She says the embarrassment that brought the sheriff's department really caused the set of dominoes to go into motion here. The first domino, literally, dropping like a block of cement. So this is the actual spot where Doug's body was it, found. It is. Encased in a metal horse-feeding trough, found on Roddy Sturdivant's farm by his property manager, Rob Poston. Ran it smelled uh, real bad, so we called the sheriff. Investigators would smash open the cement block and make a horrifying discovery. We pulled the metal back, and we saw a person that was wrapped in several different pieces of material. And that person would turn out to be none other than Tracy's boyfriend, Doug, who'd been shot and stabbed multiple times. All over his abdomen area, near his groin area, and in his buttocks. The ferocity of the murder would lead investigators to believe it was committed by someone close to him. The fatal wound was a gunshot to the top of the head. The person who committed this murder wanted to send a message right. to Doug Benton that, I hate you, right. I hate you. What you did to me, I can't stand you. I just knew in my heart that he was gone. Doug's mother, Carol, fights back tears as she remembers getting the shocking news. Well, if I 
think about it much. I get get choked up. I can't help that. He was my firstborn. He was important to me. Now, investigators begin to search for the monster who so grotesquely killed Carol's 38-year-old son. Doug's friends were polygraphed. Doors were knocked on up and down the street. Questions were asked. People were brought in to the sheriff's department and questioned. And they all had one thing in common. They mentioned Tracy. The body of Doug Bitten has been found inside a block of cement on a farm near Athens, Georgia, with a kill shot bullet wound in the head and multiple stab wounds on his lower torso. And Doug's friends and neighbors tell investigators they think they know who murdered him. They all pointed to uh, Tracy Fortune. Doug's 35-year-old girlfriend. And the only female deputy sheriff in Oglethorpe County until resigning less than four months before his murder. It was pretty obvious that she might be a suspect. There was not any indication that anybody else had done any of this. Investigators would learn that at the time of his murder, Doug and Tracy had been dating for nearly a year after meeting at a gym where the two avid bodybuilders both worked out. And he was so excited. He said, Mom, I met her, I met her. I met somebody that I really like. And Doug's mother, Carol, says it had become serious. Were you OK with that? I was very OK with it. I liked her. Tracy's mom, Sharon, was happy for her daughter, too. Tracy and Doug had a really good relationship. She loved Doug very much. But investigators say they heard some disturbing stories about their relationship. Everybody they spoke to said there was some type of violence or really aggressive behavior between the two of them. Crime author M. William Phelps, who investigated the case for his latest book, says there were reports they'd even threatened to kill each other. That Doug and her were pulling guns on each other, sticking guns to their head in arguments. Tracy would vehemently deny the allegations in this telephone interview with Crime Watch Daily. We argued just like any other couple, but we never had a physical fight, never. In the whole course of the time that we, were, we dated, we never had a physical fight. Whether there's true or not, is beside the point. Law enforcement is getting these stories and they're following them. And investigators would learn Tracy and Doug had one final argument at his house just two weeks before he was found murdered. According to Tracy, Doug tells her, get out, get out of my house, go home. Tracy says she obliged. He wanted his space, so Tracy took that as, all right, you want your space? I'm out of here. Tracy says she never saw or heard from Doug again, and nobody else did either, after he suddenly vanished. And that's what we first started investigating, was a missing persons report. The only clue to Doug's whereabouts was a mysterious note found on his car windshield saying he'd gone out of town and couldn't be reached. No one knows where Doug is. His mother hasn't heard from him. Nobody's heard from him. Doug's mother says she sensed her son was dead the moment he disappeared. I just knew. I said, he's gone. He's gone. Doug's gone. I just knew it. I don't know how. And she wonders if Doug might have even had a premonition of his impending death when he made this video of his bodybuilding accomplishments for his young son from a past marriage. I just wanted to give him something that he'll be able to remember me by in case something was to happen to me. And then when he's found dead, investigators would theorize Tracy had killed Doug in a violent rage at his house that night they broke up. He said, that's it, she's out of there. And the guy ends up dead. <laughs> Law enforcement began to file the evidence that was being presented to them and started going after Tracy. Investigators would find blood stains in Doug's living room and alleged Tracy had vainly tried to mop it up. She had cleaned the surface of the couch and all that very thoroughly. But of course, it soaked through the covering. It was just massive amount of blood. They also claim Tracy tried to later burn down the house to destroy the evidence. Someone had gone in 
and placed scented candles throughout the house like to start a fire. And I believe there was like the odor of kerosene. Of course, we pulled the carpet up and you could see the stain where the kerosene had been poured through the carpet and up over and under the couch. Tracy denies any of that, countercharging that investigators disregarded blood found on a door at the house that belonged to neither her or Doug. DNA at the crime scene that was that of a male, and it was, um, you know, it was significant. And investigators would find evidence in Tracy's home, including ammunition and a 22 caliber rifle they believe was used to fire the bullet found in Doug's head. While we couldn't say with scientific certainty that bullet was fired from that rifle, we could say this rifle was among the rifles that could have fired that bullet. Tracy claims it was all planted there to set her up. I really don't see that a person who's guilty of, of, of killing someone would leave the gun in the house, would have bullets in the house, that would be fired from that particular gun. But investigators would also find a receipt for a shower curtain they say Tracy bought to replace the one she used to wrap around Doug's body, as well as receipts for cement and a metal feeding trough to encase it that were identical to the materials used to make Doug's concrete coffin. And investigators found the same cement in the bed of Tracy's truck, which is where they say she put Doug's cement boxed body to transport it to the farm where it was dumped. The salesman remembered her buying the concrete. So there was never any indication that anybody else had done any of this, that had bought the concrete, or bought the trough, or bought the shower cur curtain. Tracy doesn't deny buying the cement and the feeding trough, but claims she was going to use the cement to build a dog run and the trough was for her own animals. Tracy goes on to say those materials were actually stolen, claiming they were probably taken by whoever killed Doug and framed her. It just seems like it's a little bit too convenient for everyone involved that uh, point the finger at Tracy and all the evidence stacks up against Tracy. Georgia investigators had amassed a mountain of damning evidence against Tracy Fordson. The former deputy sheriff they believe shot and stabbed her boyfriend, Doug Benton, to death before dumping his body in a makeshift coffin, a feeding trough filled with concrete. How strong of a case did you believe you had? I felt like we had a, a very strong case. It was all circumstantial. But we had over a hundred pieces of evidence. But even investigators themselves can't fathom why any killer, especially a trained law woman, could fail to cover their tracks so badly. You would thought that someone in law enforcement wouldn't have uh, done some of those things or left so many clues or pieces of evidence. And crime author M. William Phelps, who investigated the case, says Tracy appears to be too smart and savvy. That seems like an awful stupid criminal to me right there. Then there's the 1,500 pound question. How would Tracy possibly have had the strength to move Doug's 250 pound body packed in a cement block weighing nearly a ton from his house to a farm nearby? There was a lot of speculation of, well, how could she have done this? She was just a, 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 a girl. A bodybuilder, yes, but still just five foot six and 140 pounds. How does she pull this off by herself? She was a strong woman, but she never had to pick him up according to our theory of the case. After murdering Doug in his living room, <laughs> Investigators speculate Tracy rolled his body from the couch onto a shower curtain. Dragged it through the house, onto the porch. Where Tracy's pickup truck was backed up and waiting with an animal watering trough. Had the watering trough already in the back and put the body in the watering trough. Filled with wet cement, then dumped it on a nearby farm. The main thing was no one wanted to believe that 
a female could get the watering trough from the bed of her truck and place it into the woods. But state investigator Ben Williams says all Tracy had to do was tie a rope around a tree, and he points at the tree in this crime scene photo, which shows missing bark that he claims could have been torn off by a rope. Tied from that to the watering trough, and all she did was drive off, and the tree would have pulled the watering trough to its location. Author M. William Phelps is not so sure he buys it. It's possible. Is it probable? I don't know. But he says there's also another possibility. Tracy thinks that she was framed. Pointing out that Doug was murdered less than four months after she quit her job as a deputy sheriff and filed a sexual harassment lawsuit against the sheriff's office. They're getting back at you. That's the way I feel. Tracy would continue to allege it was a setup in this phone interview with Crime Watch Daily from prison, where she's languished for more than 17 years after being convicted of Doug's murder. I still feel that I would not be here if I had not, if I had not filed that sexual harassment case against the sheriff that I worked for. I just feel like that that is the basis and the foundation for this whole, the whole disaster. But investigators dismissed the allegation that Tracy was framed. I saw no indication of that, of any framing uh, or setup. Tracy, now 52, has already gone on trial twice, winning an appeal of her first conviction, only to be found guilty again at her second trial and sentenced to life for malice and felony murder, plus 10 years for arson because they said that um, someone tried to burn the house down to eliminate evidence. But Tracy answers the next question I ask her the same way she's answered it from day one. Did you kill Doug Benton? No, ma'am, I did not kill Doug Benton. Her mother, Sharon, has always believed her. She has been convicted, but she is not a murderer. Tracy has another ally and a most unlikely one. I really feel was a frame up. The mother of the man she's said to have killed. Do you believe Tracy is guilty now? Absolutely not. I don't think she was even part of it. You think his killer is still out there? Yeah. How does that make you feel? Makes me feel like somebody got away with the murder of my son. And after thoroughly re-examining the case from top to bottom, crime author M. William Phelps believes Doug's mother could be right. There are unanswered questions here that need to be investigated on a much deeper level. Independent. Yes, outside independent body of professional investigators should really take a look at everything that's going on here.